We live in an amazing interconnected world. A single click buys whatever we want. Air travel takes us to distant places. Local stores carry food from multiple continents. But there's a dark side to this world where we've built. It relies on systems like the internet, the power grid, banking, and they are vulnerable. In 2003, bad weather forced three small rural power plants in Italy to go offline. Twelve hours later, 56 million people in two countries were sitting in the dark without access to email or Instagram, but that's not surprising because it had not yet been invented. <laughs> when the Italy blackout occurred, scientists had just begun to investigate how complex networks of all kinds behave. These are systems with many, many parts that interact with each other in a variety of ways across connections of some kind, and they have mathematical similarities to each other. The internet, the power grid, the phone system are complex networks. So is our food supply from seed to farm to table, and public health, and the economy, and our social relationships. We call these networks complex in a technical sense to indicate that they have so many elements capable of choosing such a variety of interactions that the overall system behavior cannot always be predicted and sometimes is rather surprising. Keep in mind, what cannot be predicted cannot be controlled. This amazing new world of rapid innovation comes with vulnerabilities. The more that we buy food from distant places, pay with our cell phones, ditch print for online information, the more vulnerable we are to having those systems fail, and they can fail, especially when they have what network scientists call fragile interdependence. The internet and the power grid depend on one another. Internet nodes, of course, require power to operate. But the internet, in turn, is used in many countries to monitor and control the grid. When those power plants went offline in Italy, a regional internet node failed. That affected a wider area of the grid, which affected more internet nodes, which, well, you get the picture. Interconnected, interdependent systems have produced an amazing life for us today, and that life is shared to some degree around the world. But it comes at a cost. We truly are vulnerable to major system collapse, and that danger grows precisely as our world becomes more interconnected and interdependent. Damage or an attack on one system in one place can spread because of fragile interdependence. A small event in one place can trigger a cascade of wider and wider damage to other places and across to other systems. Hurricanes and natural disasters can cause the kind of damage that triggers system unraveling. So, unfortunately, can human attacks. In 2015, the people of Ukraine learned that their power grid could be hacked in the middle of a cold, dark winter. In the United States, in 2017, the combined national academies of sciences, engineering, and medicine issued a rare joint report. It states there is substantial potential for massive damage to the U.S. power grid 
from a variety of these causes. Such an event, good people, such an event would impact millions of people for a very long time and not just in the United States. And these leading researchers warn that we may not be able to prevent such damage from occurring. That's sobering. It sobers me. But there's some good news as well. Disasters are disastrous, yes? And even smaller events can trigger system unraveling. But the good news is that you and I, we can take actions that can counter potential system collapse. Yes, you and I. The same math that explains how the Italy blackout occurred also tells us that if we have local alternatives to some of these amazing, sophisticated systems, backup approaches to getting needs met, we can interrupt, slow down, perhaps in some cases even stop system unraveling when damage happens. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina swept in off the Gulf of Mexico and devastated the southern U.S. city of New Orleans. Afterwards, a grassroots organization sprang up to provide volunteer search and rescue in the region. Then, 12 years later, it happened again. Another massive hurricane made landfall on the southern continental United States, this time in Houston. In less than three days, Harvey caused $125 billion worth of damage and catastrophic flooding. As soon as the storm hit, the volunteers of the Cajun Navy hitched up their small personal boats filled with supplies and drove to Texas. They immediately began to rescue people who were trapped by the rising flood water. Now that water had become heavily polluted with human waste and animal waste and industrial chemicals. So many people, including authorities, feared a major outbreak of dysentery and other disease. That has happened in places hit by hurricanes the size of Harvey, but it did not happen in Houston because people were rescued and taken to places with sanitation quickly by the Cajun Navy and others. The government was still trying to get its act together. Okay. That same year, another hurricane swept up through the Caribbean. Puerto Rico was not so fortunate when Maria hit. Although the US Navy had stationed ships just off the island, filled with supplies and personnel, and had reached out to try to coordinate with local authorities both before and immediately after the storm hit, and unloaded supplies to the ports of Puerto Rico as quickly as they could. For a variety of reasons, those supplies and that aid did not reach many of the people who needed it the most. Systems collapsed in Puerto Rico. And that island continues to suffer, even today. There are two steps you and I can take to make ourselves and our communities better prepared for damage of any kind. The first is personal preparedness. When you go home tonight, make an inventory of the skills and resources you have that would be useful in an emergency. And this is true for wherever you live, whatever your condition and lifestyle might be. Can you board up a window that's broken? Do you know basic first aid? Could you start a campfire in cold weather when people are forced out of their homes? Do you have a backpack or a bucket, a utility knife, an extra blanket? Whatever you have, chances are it could be useful. 
Then increase your preparedness. Stock two weeks of packaged food and water, a solar rechargeable flashlight and phone charger. Learn first aid. Keep paper maps and cash on hand in case systems close. And you're looking at someone who wrote one of the first internet protocol stacks in Silicon Valley, and I'm saying keep some paper. <laughs> you and I have the power, if we choose, to push back against system collapse. We can do this by preparing ourselves and our communities for damage that cannot be prevented. And we can do it in ways that foster collaboration and cooperation with one another. We do not need to retreat to bunkers. But, as the airlines say, secure your own oxygen mask first. That will prepare you to help others if an emergency arises. And you know, today would be a really good day to begin. The potential for system collapse is real and it is growing. But the good news is that if you and I have even modest local backup approaches, alternatives to these big, wonderful, complex systems, we can enjoy this life with confidence because we will know that we can survive and even thrive if systems are damaged and begin to unravel. And we can do it together. Thank you.